नमस्कार वेलकम टू डेमोक्रेसीज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड आर ब्रांड न्यू शो ऑन संसद टीवी वेयर वी टेक यू थ्रू द लेटेस्ट हैपनिंग्स फ्रॉम पार्लियामेंट्स अक्रॉस द ग्लोब द शो विल आल्सो टेक यू ऑन द टूर ऑफ हाउ पार्लियामेंट्स ऑफ डिफरेंट कंट्रीज फंक्शन एंड व्हाट इज यूनिक अबाउट ईच वन ऑफ देम आई एम योर होस्ट भावना नायर इट इज ऑफन सेड दैट द इलेक्शंस आर द एसेंस ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी अ कंट्री कैन नॉट बी ट्रूली डेमोक्रेटिक until its citizens have the opportunity to choose their representatives through elections that are free and fair in today's episode we'll talk about the elections in major democracies of the world let's begin with the just concluded parliamentary elections in russia where the united russia party recorded an overwhelming victory in the elections however the number is less than what the party backed by russian president vladimir putin had won in the previous election in 2016 The election is an important part of Putin's effort to strengthen his grip on power ahead of the 2024 presidential election in which control of parliament will be the key. Russia's ruling party is poised to get 324 of the 450 seats in the next national parliament. The results gave United Russia 49.8% of the vote of 225 seats. 225 more lawmakers are chosen directly by the voters. United Russia candidates 198 of these elections the communist party the second biggest political force in the parliament will get 57 seats an improvement from 42 seats 5 years ago Between 17 to 19 September, Russia held elections at local, regional, and national level. Most importantly, to the State Duma, the lower house of the Federal Assembly. Voting was held across the country's 11 time zones to elect 450 deputies for a five-year term. In addition to Duma seats, Russian voters will elect members of 39 regional parliaments and nine regional leaders. Major political parties that contested elections included United Russia Ruling Party, Communist Party of the Russian Federation, Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, Fair Russia Party, New People and Just Russia. Russia has a mixed electoral system. 225 seats of the State Duma are elected through legislative constituencies. The other 225 are elected through party lists. In the 2021 elections a new state duma will be formed for the next 5 years. Since 2000 the United Russia party has won all federal elections and most at the regional and local level. Since 2003 the state duma has been dominated by the pro Putin United Russia party that currently holds three quarter super majority with 334 seats. Apart from United Russia Three parties made it past the threshold in every Duma election since 2003. These include the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, the KPRF, Liberal Democratic Party of Russia (LDPR), and Just Russia. The latter two often act in coordination with the government in the parliament. And to understand how the Russian parliamentary system works, it is important to look at its historical background. and the constitutional framework of the country take a look the government of present day russia is significantly different from what it was in the years that followed the break up of the erstwhile soviet republic in the 90s russia saw a massive power struggle between its executive and legislative branches This tussle was over the issue of constitutional authority and the pace and direction of democratic and economic reforms in the country. The crisis between the Russian president Boris Yeltsin and the Russian parliament reached a flashpoint in 1993. This had to be resolved by military force. Matters came to a head in September 1993 when President Yeltsin dissolved the Russian parliament. On 12 December, 3/5 of Russian voters ratified a new constitution that Yeltsin proposed. Representatives were elected to this new legislature. On 25th December, the Russian Constitution came into force. The Russian Federation is a multi-party representative democracy. The federal government has three branches: executive, legislative, and judicial. The executive power is held by the government of Russia. The deputy prime minister and federal ministers are members of the government. 
The constitution appoints the president as the head of the state. Elected through a national vote, the president cannot serve more than two terms in a row. The president has significant powers. A 2008 constitutional amendment extended the term of the president from four to six years after 2012. As Russia's head of state, the president is empowered to appoint the prime minister, key judges and cabinet members. The president is also the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and can declare martial law or emergency. According to the constitution, the Federal Assembly is the national legislature of the Russian Federation. Russia has bicameral parliamentary system and consists of two houses. The upper house is the Federation Council of Russia, the 450-member State Duma and the 170-member Federation Council adopts federal law, declares war, approves treaties and has the power to impeach the president. The judiciary of Russia interprets and applies the law. It consists of the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court and lower federal courts. Germany will elect a new federal parliament this Sunday. The national elections are expected to have important implications for the country's future as the country's first female chancellor, Angela Merkel, one of the most powerful global leaders, steps down after nearly 60 years in power. With Chancellor Angela Merkel departing as one of the most significant politicians in a generation, the German elections of 26 September will be very closely watched. This is the first time since 2005 that national elections will take place without her. Europe's economic powerhouse and most populous country will go to the polls on Sunday to elect a new government. There are 47 parties running in the election, but few have realistic hopes of crossing the 5% threshold. The biggest group in the outgoing parliament, the centre-right union bloc made up the Christian Democratic Union, the Christian Social Union and the Social Democratic Party of Germany. The strongest opposition party is the right-wing populist alternative for Germany, which in terms of its politics is largely isolated from the other parties. However, at present it appears that the Liberal Free Democrats and the Green Party could play a key role in the formation of the government, while the left-wing Socialist Party also cannot be ruled out. The election also gains significance as one of the world's toughest women chancellor, Angela Merkel, is standing down after 16 era-defining years at the helm of Germany. The country's first female German chancellor has served a record four times in government. While she has her critics, she has overall been a source of stability, coherence and consultation. Merkel will be remembered by many Germans as a stateswoman who led the country through a series of crises while maintaining a sense of calm and order. Named the world's most powerful woman by Forbes magazine for the last 10 years in a row, Merkel has been cast as a powerful defender of liberal values in the West. Although Germans do not directly elect a new chancellor, they will place two votes to determine the makeup of the parliament. Every German citizen over the age of 18 is eligible to vote in the elections, resulting in 60.4 million eligible voters, 31.2 million women and 29.2 million men. Germans place two votes on election day, one for the candidates in their constituency and another for the political party lists. As Germany's 2021 election campaign enters the final stretch, the vote on 26 September has turned into the country's most unpredictable in decades. With a few days to go, the centre-left Social Democrats are favourites to be the largest party ahead of Merkel's centre-right Union bloc and the Greens. But whoever comes out ahead, Germany is likely to end up with a three-way coordination, a rarity at national level. Moving on to our next story, coming in from Japan, official elections campaigning started last week for the next head of Japan's governing Liberal Democratic Party. The winner will become the leader of the world's number three economy, shaping key political, military and security roles in the region. 
two men and unusually for Japan, two women are competing in the September 29 vote to replace outgoing Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. Their policies focus on anti-coronavirus measures and economy hobbled by the pandemic and how to deal with, from Tokyo's perspective, China's increasingly menacing role in the regional affairs. In our next report, take a look at the top candidates contesting in the national elections. Taro Kono Considered something of a maverick in Japan's largely conservative political culture, he is the minister in charge of vaccinations and a front-runner in the election. 58-year Kono is an avid Twitter user and popular among young fans, a rarity in a Japanese political world dominated by elderly men. A liberal on social issues, Kono supports same-sex marriage and advancing the role of women. Having served as Foreign and Defence Minister, Kono says he will work with countries that share democratic values to counter China's growing assertiveness in regional seas. Outgoing Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga has announced his support for Kono, praising his achievement in speeding up vaccinations. Fumio Kishida, 64-year-old former Foreign Minister, calls for a further increase of Japan's defence capability and budget and vows to stand up to China in tensions in the Taiwan Strait and Beijing's crackdown on dissent in Hong Kong. On the economy, Kishida calls for a new capitalism of growth and distribution to narrow income gaps between the rich and the poor that have been worsened by the pandemic. He pledges to promote clean energy technology to combat climate change. Seiko Noda, a long time hopeful to become Japan's first female leader Noda is entering the race for the first time at the age of 61. She has served as Postal, Internal Affairs and Gender Equality Ministers. A late entry in the race, Noda is running for the week and to achieve diversity, a goal that other candidates did not highlight. She supports same-sex marriage and acceptance of sexual diversity, as well as a legal change to allow separate surnames for married couples and has campaigned for a quota system to increase the number of female lawmakers. Sane Takechi, an ultra-conservative former internal affairs minister, Takechi shares Abe's revisionist views on Japan's wartime atrocities and hawkish stance on security. Her security policies include developing a preemptive strike capability to counter threats from China and North Korea. Moving ahead, top legislators of the world were in Austria's capital, Vienna, earlier this month for the first major in-person global parliamentary meeting post-COVID-19 outbreak. The Austrian parliament, in cooperation with the United Nations, organized the meeting that had the theme, parliaments and the global governance, the unfinished agenda. Lok Sabha Speaker Om Birla led the Indian delegation. Over 100 speakers from 115 national parliaments and heads of over a dozen regional and other parliamentary organizations attended the 5th World Conference of Speakers of Parliament in Vienna on the 7th and 8th of September. At the two-day conference, the speakers adopted a high-level declaration on parliamentary leadership for effective multilateralism that delivers sustainable development for the people and the planet. The declaration underscored the importance of international solidarity between parliaments in recovery efforts from the COVID-19 pandemic. IPU President Dueto Pacheco mentioned the recent human rights violations of parliamentarians in many countries, including Myanmar, Afghanistan, Guinea and Tunisia. We wish that the new power in Afghanistan, we urge the new power of Afghanistan to respect all parliamentarians, the integrity of all our colleagues, because they have the right to do it. On Sunday, just this week, another military cup took place, this time in Guinea. We strongly condemned the dissolution of the National Assembly and the use of force 
to change the constitutional order. The Indian delegation led by Lok Sabha Speaker Om Birla had Rajya Sabha Deputy Chairman Harivansh Narayan Singh among others on the theme of repealing laws that discriminate against women and girls. Om Birla said India had repealed, amended and enacted several laws to protect women against social discrimination, violence and atrocities. Bharat ne savidhanik और कानूनी प्रावधानों के तहत ग्रामीण और शहरी क्षेत्र के निर्वाचित निकायों में महिलाओं को एक तिहाई से लेकर कुछ राज्यों में 50 प्रतिशत तक की सीटें आरक्षित करने का प्रावधान किया गया है अतः सभी देश की संसदों और जनप्रतिनिधियों को जेंडर इक्वलिटी जेंडर सेंसिटिव समाज के लिए मिलकर काम करने की आवश्यकता है While the Austrian National Council president underscored the need to find international solutions for global problems, former deputy speaker of the National Assembly of Afghanistan called for international support for all Afghans at risk. What's happening in Afghanistan should be a concern to all of us. We have to act together in providing those under threat safe place. I therefore call on all of you to use your power back home. to show solidarity with afghan people first and and foremost with those who are at risk the summit also highlighted the togetherness of all world parliaments during the covid-19 pandemic emergency and now talking about the women speakers of parliament summit the 13th summit of the women speakers of parliament was also held in the month of september the in person meeting brought together some of the women speakers of parliament across the world Women speakers form only 25% of the speakers across the world indicating the distance gender equality has to travel across world parliaments the women speakers summit was an attempt to address these concerns as well as to honor women from all walks of life who have been part of the covid-19 response worldwide The 13th summit of women speakers of parliament was jointly organized by the interparliamentary union the united nations and the austrian parliament it underlined the importance of putting gender equality and women empowerment at the heart of the pandemic response at the summit women parliamentarians exchanged ideas and experiences that are of interest to the national and international agendas this year on international women's day we welcome the highest ever number of women parliamentarians with the global average rising to 25.5% not nearly high enough but still a needed improvement women parliamentarians are gaining the critical mass and the power to enlarge the space for action to influence legislation strengthen oversight and create the conditions for further change and progress In my own country, Egypt, women's representation in Egypt's parliament reached history highs after a constitutional amendment was approved in 2020 to allocate one quarter of seats in the House of Representatives to women. Women make up 70% of the caregivers who have fought at the front lines of the COVID-19. But 60% of women remain today without due support, without due social support. social care and are thrown overboard the social security train something is not right in this formula the workload and responsibility grows as the support and acknowledgement decreases let's now look at the numbers of women in national parliaments in its latest report on women in parliament report the interparliamentary union says that women parliamentarians worldwide constituted over 25% in 2020 a historic first but still far from gender parity at the current rate of progress gender parity in national legislative bodies will not be achieved before 2063 as on 1st january 2021 women accounted for 50% or more of members in just three parliaments rwanda cuba and the united arab emirates in 2020 the world economic forum listed india at 122 out of 153 countries in terms of women's representation in parliament To get more insight on this let's go across to our guest Ragna Anna daughter secretary general of Althingi the Icelandic parliament a very warm welcome to Sunset TV madam thank you 
So let me begin with you with our first question on the recently conducted 13th summit of uh, women speakers of parliament. And uh, the IPO's latest women in parliament report says that global proportion of women in parliament reached a record of 25.5%, which is an increase of 0.6 points compared to 2019. And the Iceland parliament has also seen that women representation has increased drastically. Uh, the Iceland uh, uh, introduced the universal adult franchise in way back 1915. What would you like to say about the increasing women representation of parliament uh, in all over the globe? I would say that uh, it's, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me to your program. Uh, it has been, uh, it's a really important uh, topic and uh, it is really important that uh, women and men are equally represented in the parliaments. In the parliaments we take, uh, or in the parliamentarians, they take uh, the most important decisions uh, concerning our uh, countries and our societies. So Iceland has been uh, of, uh, in, in, in many ways uh, in, in the forefront of, of uh, gender equality. And now we have uh, about 40% women and 60% men here in parliament. A slight decrease from, from uh, the sessions before these, uh, these elections, before these elections. Uh, uh, so uh, we have had a slight decrease, but you know, in this, these matters, um, there is always, you know, it's not not always straight ahead. It's always like a bit forward and then a bit backwards and then forwards and backwards. So, I guess uh, uh, we have to be patient in this, uh, as as in, in every every matter. Countries like Rwanda, Cuba, and the United Arab Emirates, women accounted to fifty percent or more of members in just three parliament. What is that these countries are doing for women, which others are not doing? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, in, in countries which uh, have uh, equal representation and, and high uh, level of, of women representation in, in, uh, in parliament, there, of course, uh, is uh, uh, an emphasis on, on enabling women to participate in this decision-making process and enabling women to participate in, in politics. And uh, thinking of, you know, uh, uh, research uh, show that uh, women are uh, the prime uh, caretakers in, in, the, in homes. And that is also in Iceland, although we are supposed to be uh, at the forefront in, in gender equality. So I, I think that uh, it's, it's of, of uh, uh, importance to uh, enable women to participate in the, the, uh, the decision-making process, to enable them to go out of the homes and, you know, uh, that uh, the, the caretaking uh, role is not, you know, uh, devouring them in a way that they cannot uh, take on other responsibilities. So, I mean, you have uh, lots of... Um, uh, methods to do that and, and of course you can have legislation in place, you can uh, you can of course have a legislation enforcing you know, gender equality and, and, and I suppose we are going to discuss that a bit later but uh, well it would be of course the best thing if it would happen naturally but that has not been the case. The COVID pandemic has worsened the inequalities worldwide madam, what kind of concerted action is now needed globally to educate and empower women. Pandemic has uh, hit harder on women in, uh, and, and um, uh, some other groups. And uh, I think that it's uh, important to, to focus on that. And I mean, of course, we, there are some tools uh, in place, of course, which has been uh, used uh, and, and with good results. For example, legislation. Uh, but, you know, in order to have a legislation and, and to get people to comply with this legislation, I think, you know, you have to, to have other uh, pieces also in place, such as we agree that women uh, should play equal part in, in society. I think that, you know, you can have all the legislation you want in, in, in the world, but you also need, you know, an understanding and realization that... Uh, this pandemic has hit women harder than men, as uh, uh, 
uh, as some some uh, uh, as, as as had been uh, proven, for example, when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to taking care of the sick, when it comes to losing wages, or when it uh, comes to to uh, many other things. And madam, what do you think? What should be the role of the men in this? in this uh, gender parity and bring women together and increase the women representation in parliament. We are talking about, you know, half of my, mankind. And of course, diversity is good. And it's good to be, to have half of mankind or half of the population represented in this decision making. It only makes, you know, it only in, enhances and, uh, the, and, and uh, uh, makes the decision making better and all the discussion and the working culture. So, I mean, I think it's, I think sometimes it is, should we women be always talking about gender equality? Why shouldn't men be at the forefront of this debate? Because it's also for their gain to, to have this uh, wide participation. So I would say that Instead of us talking about, you know, why everybody should hire women and why women should be in parliaments or, or why women should be represented, I would say and call on men to say, I mean, tell us why we shouldn't be there. You, you just tell us. Or, and if you agree that we should be there, so speak about it and, 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 and you should sort of, we should have a gender equality conference. I'm not saying only attended by men but 50-50 at least, 50% men and 50% women. That's all we have in this edition of Democracies of the World. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Namaskar.